Today I want to look at a rule that's kind of like a higher derivative version of the chain rule, and it's called the Fa de Bruno formula. So let's look at what it says, and we'll unpack the parts, look at an example, and then finally sketch a proof. So what it says is that the nth derivative of this composition, f of g of x, is equal to the sum over a and pn, we'll go over what pn means, of f or the eighth derivative, I should say the number of elements in eighth derivative of f evaluated at g, and then that's multiplied by the product over all of the elements a in big A of the number of elements in eighth derivative of g of x. So obviously there's a lot going on there. So let's unpack it. And then I think looking at maybe the smallest interesting example will kind of show us what all of these parts mean. Okay, so this p sub n, I'm using that to mean the partitions of the set one, two, three, up to n. So what's the partition of a set? Well, it's a way of taking a set and decomposing it into disjoint subsets. So you might say, well, how many partitions are there of a set like this? Well, that's related to something called a Bell number, which I'll let you look up if you want to. I believe I did a video on the channel on Bell numbers much earlier. Okay, so anyway, P of N is the set of all partitions of this set 1 to n, and that number gets big really quick. Or I guess I should say the number of partitions gets big really quick. Okay, so now notice that if we've got a partition of this, a partition will be a set of subsets. It's a set of disjoint subsets that union to this whole set. And so that means if we take A inside of P of N, that means that that capital A is itself a partition of N. And, well, what is this? This is the number of elements in A, but notice that the elements of A are subsets of 1 up to N. And, well, this is take, talking about how many subsets we're decomposing 1 up to N into. I'll call those the parts. So anyway, this cardinality of A is the number of parts of the partition A. Okay. But now, remember, A itself is a set of subsets. And so if we take an element from A, it is itself a single subset of our parent set up here. So down here, we've got little a inside of big A. So little a is a subset of 1 up to n. And the cardinality of little a, that'll just be the number of elements in this given set, which, like I said, is a subset of our parent set right here. Okay, so let's look at an example. And I think the smallest example that really helps us understand what's going on here is the n equals 3 example. And if you want to, like, work out the n equals 1 and 2 case, you can, but those are easy to see just by, you know, taking the derivative a couple times. Okay, so if we've got n equal 3, then p sub 3 will be all of the partitions of 3. Okay, so how could we write that down? Well, our first partition of 3 will simply be made of singletons. So there, I've got my first partition of 3, which that partition contains the singleton 1, the singleton 2, and the singleton 3. Okay, nice. And then, well, I'm going to put these all on a new line just because it'll make it all easier. Then my next partition will contain a one singleton and two doubletons. So perhaps the first one would be the singleton one and then the doubleton two, three. So that would be the first of that type. Then we would have the singleton two and then the doubleton one, three. And then finally, the singleton 3 and the doubleton 1, 2. Okay, so that's my next flavor of partitions of the set 1 up to 3. I guess I could just say 1, 2, 3. Great. And what's the last partition of 3? Well, I think that's pretty easy to see. That's just going to be the whole set. So that'll be the set containing 1, 2, 3.
Okay, cool. So notice uh, this is a lot of just sets within sets within sets, but this is what's required. Here, I'm gonna underline these things a little bit. So this is our first partition, the partition of the set one, two, three into singletons. And then here we've got three partitions here, which are related to breaking it into one singleton and two doubletons. And this is the partition of the set one, two, three into, well, itself. And I think, you know, just by visual inspection, that's gonna be all of the partitions of the set from one to three. Okay, cool. So now let's apply this formula right here to these, you know, partitions. Okay, so what is this going to give us? So this is going to give us the third derivative of f evaluated at g of x. Now, how do we see that? Well, notice that the number of parts of this partition is three. And that's what we get right here, the number of parts. And then we've got to take the product over these three elements of the partition. And that product is going to give us the eighth derivative of g, where by that, I mean the number of elements in each of those sets. But notice that's simply gonna be the first derivative three times. So I could go ahead and write that as g prime of x cubed. Okay, great. So now let's see what we get for this part right here. I'm gonna do this middle one because as we'll see, these three will be the same. Okay, so this is partitioning it into two parts. So by my formula over there, that means that I need the second derivative of f of g of x. And then what derivatives of g do I need? Well, I need a second derivative because of this uh, object, this set with two elements, and a first derivative from this. So I've got g double prime of x times g prime of x. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this by three because all of these right here give us the same derivative structure, if you will. And that's because the elements inside of the partitions don't actually matter. It just matters how many of them we have. Okay, so now what do we get for this last one? So notice that there's a single part of this partition. So we're gonna get f prime of g of x but that part has three elements, so that's gonna give us g, g triple prime of x. So now putting this all together, we'll see that the third derivative of f of g of x is in fact equal to what? Well, it's gonna be the third derivative of f evaluated at g of x, and then we've got g prime of x cubed, and then plus three times the second derivative of f of g of x times g double prime of x times g prime of x. And then finally, we've got plus the first derivative of f of g of x times g triple prime of x. And there we have it. That would be our third derivative. And you can check that just by taking the derivative a few times. Okay, so now we've done this example, which hopefully shed some light on how this formula works. And now let's sketch a proof of it. So thanks for sticking around this long into the video. If you haven't clicked the thumbs up button, make sure and do that if you're enjoying the video. And if you're not yet subscribed, it really helps us out when you subscribe. So consider doing that as well. Okay, so our proof will be via induction, which means we need a base case, but the base case is simply the normal chain rule. So we'll just take that as a fact. And then, well, we need the induction step. And here I'm sketching out our calculation of the induction step. So we'll take the n plus first derivative of our composition f of g of x, which is of course equal to the derivative of the nth derivative of f of g of x. But we can take this nth derivative right here and simply write it with the formula because in an induction proof we're assuming that we're good up to a point and then we prove that that allows us to maybe bridge over to the next case. That's exactly what we're doing right here. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll take the derivative of this thing right here. But notice that I've got a big product here. 
So I've got to use the product rule when taking this derivative. So, okay, so let's get to it. So this is going to be the sum over all partitions of n. I'll call them a, just like I did in the formula right there. And now let's first take the derivative of this f uh, of a, or I guess I should say the eighth derivative of f of g of x. Okay, so that's going to give us this a plus first derivative of g of x. And I'm kind of being fast and loose with my verbal notation when I say eighth, I really mean the number of elements in this set A, but I think, you know, it's kind of worth it because it makes all of the words shorter. Okay, so anyway, let's look at this. We've got this A plus first derivative of F of G of X. And then of course, by the chain rule, we need that multiplied by G prime. And then that's gonna be multiplied into all of this next stuff just as is. So I'm just kind of bringing that down. Okay, so like I said, that would be the first part. Then I'm gonna put a big parentheses here because I'm like bringing the derivative inside the sum because the derivative is linear. And now let's take the derivative of this product right here. But that means that I need to sum that over taking the derivative one part at a time. So let's be careful with that. We're gonna have the eighth derivative of f evaluated at g of x. And then, well, let's pick out one of these a in a's to take the derivative of. And so that would be something like this. We've got the sum over all a in a of g, well, the a plus first derivative of that, but then we're gonna product that into all of the rest of the terms here without the derivative. So I'm gonna write that as the product over all b in a, where b is not equal to a. And then we've got g, the b derivative of that. Okay, so there we've got the whole thing going on right there. And now I'd like to recognize each of these as a way to build all of the partitions of one to n plus one out of the partitions of one to n. So let's look at these first. Okay, so this is gonna be an important flavor. So this is gonna be equal to, well, actually let's pay attention to what happened here. Here we increase the number of parts of the partition and we can increase the number of parts of a partition from one to n simply by including the singleton n plus one. And that turns it into a partition of one to n plus one um, built out of, kind of naturally built out of a partition one to n. Okay, so this is a partition, a partition of one to n plus one, which is equal to a partition of the set one to n union the singleton n plus one. Okay, nice. We can see that again, two different places. The fact that the number of parts is increasing by one. If we include the singleton, we're including one more part. And then, well, where else also? Well, notice that this singleton n plus one would be built, or sorry, would build this first derivative of g. Okay, nice. So now let's look at this other part right here. And this other part, should hopefully take care of all of the other types of partitions. And in fact, it does. And what we'll notice is that this is the partitions of the set one to n plus one that are built by including the number n plus one in the parts of the partition from one to n, one at a time. And we can see that because the number of parts is not increasing. And that's because we're just taking the original parts of our partition and one at a time we're pushing n plus one into them. So like I said, the parts don't increase. So that's why we have this right here, the same power of, I shouldn't say power, derivative of F. But then we see right here, this, a plus one or number of elements of a plus one is indicative of taking that partition of one to n and including n plus one. That plus one is the n plus one. And the one at a time because well, we have this sum right here and this sum is only putting them in one at a time and then the product is 
everything else is just staying the same. Okay, cool. But now what we can see, and here this has gotten a little bit out of order, but what we can see is that in our yellow description of our new partitions, which are one to n plus one, and then this green description of new partitions, that's all of the partitions of n plus one, or I should say the set containing one to n plus one. So we could do some re-indexing, and this becomes the sum as a goes over p sub n plus one, all of the partitions of n plus one of the capital A derivative of f of g of x times the product over all little a n a of the little a derivative of g of x, which is exactly what we needed to do to finish this proof by induction. And that's a good place to stop.